of the Kathmandu Triennale uh, 2077, uh, which is the title of the show. Um, and today we'll be actually doing a little bit of background on um, the Triennale and, and really thanking people. So I would really, um, you know, sort of, we're going to take the time to actually recognize and acknowledge people in the beginning. And then we'll be engaging in a lot of conversations. But I, I feel quite emotional actually being able to finally say that we are launching this. This has been a project for over three years now that has been in the make. Um, and we are finally being able to start and to really begin and to be able to show all the beautiful and amazing narratives and works and artist works um, in the show. So um, in order to begin today, I am actually um, wanted to first recognize some of the difficulties and challenges we faced in the COVID pandemic. Um, and we wanted to start by commemorating those that we've lost. So we have three artists in Nepal who passed away recently in 2021. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Rajkumar Sakya Ekaram Singh and Shankar Raj Singh Suwal. Um, and we're lucky to be able to show Ekaram Singh's work uh, in the Triennale, and we're really grateful for that. Um, but we'd really like to recognize um, their life's work um, and sort of just begin with that. Um, and also, we wanted to realize that, I mean, I wanted to introduce the fact that this edition of the Kathmandu Triennale is um, a collaboration. It's jointly organized with the ministry, uh, Nepal's Ministry of uh, Culture, Tourism, and Civil Aviation. And we would like to officially launch the program uh, with an opening statement from the minister, uh, Graham Bader, the Honorable Minister Graham Bader Ali. And today, actually, we also have uh, the Under Secretary um, Mangala Pradhan, who's also here with us today, and she's been amazing at supporting us through this whole process. So thank you for being here with us. But we'd like to show a little bit of the video. Uh, this was recorded. Um, <clears throat> let me just stop the screening. Um, great, Ruby, thank you. So we're going to start with the opening statement of the pre-launch. मंत्रालय को तरफबाट हार्दिक स्वागत गर्न चाहन्छु नेपालको विविधता युक्त सामाजिक परिवेशमा कला इतिहास अनेको समुदाय तथा कला परम्पराका कलाकारका अभिव्यक्तिका माध्यम र अन्य अमूर्त सांस्कृतिक सम्पदाहरूलाई जोगाउन र गौरवका साथ प्रचार गर्न अत्यन्त जरुरी रहेको सत्यप्रति नेपाल सरकार गम्भीर छ नेपालको सांस्कृतिक पर्यावरण कला संस्कृति र नेपालको गौरवपूर्ण इतिहास का अग्रणी संपादकों को जगेरना रा संरचना हेतु मंत्रालय विभिन्न संस्था तथा व्यक्ति और संघ नजीक रही काम करते आए को सब लाई विविध ही था ऐसे क्रम में ऐसे काठमांडू ट्रेन आए ने 2070 को 70 को आए ना रा संचालन का लागी यह संस्कृति पढ़ने तथा नागरिक उद्यम मंत्रालय रसीदारता आर्ट फाउंडेशन आपु स्वयं समेत अत्यंत हर्षित एवं कार्यक्रम को सफलता का लागी आशाबादी समेत रहे कुछ यह संस्करण बाटा शुरू भाई को काट पांडू ट्रेना ने संघ को नेपाल सरकार संस्थिति पर्दिन तथा नागरिक उद्यम मंत्रालय को सरकारी ले नेपाल को संस्थिति संपदा संरचना मातेवा पुराने सब बंदे विश्वास लिए कुछ विभिन्न विषय � पाटन संग्रहालय, बहादुर साहब बैठक, तारागांव संग्रहालय और नेपाल आर्ट काउंसिल जस्ता स्थान और उमा संचालन होने ट्रेनाले ले नेपाली कला तथा संस्कृति को विश्व व्यापार की प्रचार प्रसार कराई नेपाल लाई एक सांस्कृतिक पर्यटन को गंतव्य बनाऊं ना महत्वपूर्ण भूमिका निर्वाह करने सब बने विश्वास लिए बहुस्तरीय र बहुक्षेत्रीय आयाम को शुरुआत रूप में 
रही को यो कार्यक्रम आप ही में एक ऐतिहासिक उपलब्धि बनोस बनने सुबह का मना रखना चाहिए चो ऐसे संदर्भ में ऐसा कि सन 2009 2012 2017 में यही कार्यक्रम का अगला संस्करण और को आज दमार्फत नेपाली भूमिका सराहना करता हूँ। आगामी वर्षों में समेत यह किसी को सहकारी कायम रखना सरकार को तरफ बाट पूर्ण सहयोग रहने विश्वास पनी दिलाऊंगा चांस हो। विश्व व्यापी महामारी सिर्जित हाल को चुनौती पूर्ण परिस्थिति को सामना करता कर दे। वर्चुअल र प्रतिष्ठे दो ही थरी कार्यक्रम को संचालन संभव पार्ना कार्यक्रम अंते मां नेपाल रा विदेश बाटा आउनु भाई का संपूर्ण कलाकार औरो क्यूरेटर राष्ट्र सेवक कर्मचारी सुरक्षा कर्मी मित्र औरो पत्रकार साथी औरो तथा स्वाभाविक संपूर्ण लाय संपूर्ण लाय हार्दिक बधाई रा स्वागत कर दे संस्था सिद्धार्थ आठ फाउंडेशन रा आयोजक समूह साथी औरो लाय इस बब्बे प्रदर्शन Thank you for that, um, to the Honorable Minister Prem Bahadur Ali. Um, and with that, we actually officially launched um, the Triennale. And um, I think this is definitely a historic uh, collaboration with the ministry for the state to also come and, and support the arts in this way. So we'd really like to thank um, the ministry for this. And alongside that, I'd like to actually invite Sangeeta Thapa uh, who is the chair um, of the Kathmandu Triennale, but also the founder and director of Siddhartha Arts Foundation. Um, I'd like to, for her to share a few words. I'm actually, uh, to introduce myself, I'm the director of the Kathmandu Triennale uh, of this edition. And um, I'd like to invite Sangeeta Thapa to share a few words. Is my voice audible? I know that some people were commenting that it was very low. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. All right. Sangeeta Thapaji, can I offer the floor to you? Thank you so much, Sharari. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Honorable Minister for Culture, Tourism, and Civil Aviation, Shiprem Aliju. This Triennale indeed marks a historic collaboration with the Ministry of Culture, and we look forward to working with the Ministry of Culture, Tourism, and Civil Aviation again in 2025. Your Excellency, Manglaji, board members of the Siddhartha Arts Foundation, partnering institution Parasite, esteemed patrons, the various foundations and institutions, corporate sponsors, artists, curators, venue partners, friends, members of the media, and our own outstanding Triennale team. As the founder and chair of the Kathmandu Triennale, I would like to thank you for joining us this evening for the virtual launch of the Triennale. As you all know, the Triennale was set to open in 2020. Who could have imagined that a pandemic would envelop the whole world with such tragic and devastating consequences? In the maelstrom of this bewildering time, two of our own Triennale artists, Rajkumar Sakya and Ekaramji passed away. Nepal also lost senior artist Sankara Singh Suwal and master woodcarver Lakshmi Marzan from Bungamati. Our director, Sharari Bajracharya, curators Hitman Gurung, Shilasa Raj Bandari, several team members and I also got COVID, despite all the precautions we took. Through these bewildering times and what seemed like a never ending obstacle race, our team never lost hope and strength. And I'm grateful to each one of them for staying calm, determined and committed. I would like to share that each iteration of the Kathmandu International Art Festival and later the Kathmandu Triennale took place in the most challenging of times. The Kathmandu International Art Festival was conceived after a bloody civil war that spanned a decade from 1996 to 2006. We should not forget that the war led to 17,886 deaths, 1,500 disappeared, 
and 8,191 disabled men, women, and children. It was the artists, writers, poets, and their socio-political artivism that inspired me to walk, work towards creating a triannual international art forum that would reflect and introspect on socio-political issues. Against this backdrop of violence, a new constitution was promulgated in 2007, which guaranteed 33% representation of women in government. But what did this really mean for the women in Nepal or for women around the world fighting to assert their rights? Thus was born the theme of the first Kathmandu International Art Festival, Myth and Reality, the Status of Women, with over 100 artists from 35 countries participating in this event. In 2012, our present director, Sharari Bajacharya, joined the KIF team and we registered the Siddharth Arts Foundation as a nonprofit organization with the mission to promote Nepal's arts and culture while establishing Kathmandu as a center for socially aware art practices. The theme of the second Kathmandu International Art Festival was based around the important issue of climate change. Why climate change, you may ask? Between 1990 and 2009, the threat of glacial lake outbursts loomed large in the Himalayas, particularly in view of the impact of climate change and frequent seismic activity. We sought to draw attention to the fact that if the water towers of the Himalayas were to melt, we would flood 35 nations downstream. Our geographical connectivity through the waters of the Himalayas needs to be understood, as does introspection of our footprint on the environment and ecology. For both editions of KIF, Susan Chitrakar, Program Coordinator of Kathmandu University, and later Nainthara Kakshapati, co-founder of Photo Circle, were instrumental in the aesthetic installation of artworks which was spread across the city in 16 different venues. After the second edition of KIF, we realized that we needed an experienced curator on board to realize the entire scope of the festival. But once again, a calamity was to befall the nation. The great earthquakes of 2015 led to 8,219 deaths, 17,866 people being injured, 4.2 million people affected, and 2.8 million people displaced. The third edition of the KIF was postponed and the Siddharth Arts Foundation began to work on local capacity development. Nishchal Oli led the Siddharth Arts Foundation Education Initiative, which was designed to build a sustainable arts ecology. We invited experts in the field of art writing, festival management, art for communities with special needs, curating in art spaces, and we worked on creating creative ways to engage the community. In 2016, we invited Virangana Kumar, Kumari Solanki from India, she's here with us today, to lead a seminar on curation. And on her recommendation, we invited Philip Van Kouterin, director of the Smack Museum in Ghent, to conduct a seminar on curating in public spaces. In the same year, we decided to morph the arts festival into a triennale format as a re-articulation of our commitment to the arts and as a way to leverage Kathmandu as an international arts hub. We also invited Philippe to curate the 2017 Triennale. As a homage to the city, which had suffered so much damage during the earthquake, Philippe set the theme of the Triennale, the city my life, the city my studio. The Triennale functioned as a terrain for the exploration of urban experiences. It created a unique threshold of awareness about the city where artists documented their own responses. Nishal Oli, the director of the Triennale and the Triennale team planned activities, special engagement programs prior to and during the Triennale with national and visiting artists, curators, and experts on the theme of the city. Special encounters were designed alongside the production and presentation of the exhibits to realize meaningful experiences for a diverse and responsive audience. The vision of this edition of the Triennale is led by our dynamic artistic director, Cosmin Constinas from Parasite Hong Kong, and our own young and dynamic curators, Shilasa Raj Bandari and Hitman Gurung, whom I have known since they were students in art college. 
it has been a joy to see them grow. Incidentally, they are also the curators of the Nepal Pavilion this April in Venice. Our curators will be speaking about the multiple themes within the Triennale. As a precursor to the Triennale in Kathmandu, Cosmin hosted the exhibition Garden of Six Seasons in Hong Kong. This edition of the Triennale has multiple themes and is the largest and most ambitious to date with 300 beautiful works. Artists from as far as the Banaba Islands, Africa and South America will be represented in this exhibition. In fact, I had no idea where the Banaba Islands was and I had to look it up after Cosbin said we have artists from the Banaba Islands. After the Triennale in Nepal, a selection of the works will also travel to Savvy Contemporary in Berlin. Our director, Sharari Bajracharya, and the Triennale team have worked around the clock to make the Triennale a reality, exploring virtual and hybrid op options, uh, implementing safety and health protocols for our viewers. The Triennale, I would like to mention, also serves to train the next generation of arts managers in the country. I'm confident that this team will develop new skills to facilitate the growth of the local contemporary scene. I see that our own artists, art practitioners and writers will grow from this edition of the Triennale. The conversation series, performances and our community engagement programs have been designed with great thought and care. The local and international media attention we garner will help to establish Kathmandu as an international arts hub. We look forward to your presence in Kathmandu when the exhibition opens in March. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sanita Ji. Um, and uh, I'd like to actually continue along Sangeeta Ji's um, sort of thought and her process, the process that she sh she's been sharing to sort of thank the amount of resources and the kind of support that's needed for something like this to happen. Um, so we'd really like to thank our patrons and our supporters actually individually and also the team um, and make that formal acknowledgement at this point in time. Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> Can you show the full screen? Yeah, there you go. Um, so as organizers, um, from the Ministry of Culture, Tourism, and Civil Aviation and the Siddhartha Arts Foundation, we'd like to welcome you. Um, and we'd really like to acknowledge our partner institution, Parasite. Um, Parasite has been a source of tremendous technical support, tremendous emotional and moral support, and, and, and tremendous financial support. Um, the kind of open arms that you have shared with us, we are extremely grateful. And this has been such an amazing journey to go with you. Um, and we have our platinum patrons who are actually here today. So thank you so much, uh, Wellington and Virginia Yee for believing in us and for having such absolute trust and faith in our work um, and, and just believing that something like this can happen in a place like Nepal and, and really coming with us and, and understanding that it's important for this to really um, happen. And so people like you really make this happen. So thank you to Wellington and Virginia Yee as well. Uh, <clears throat> can we go to the next slide, Ruby? Thank you. Um, the Foundation for Arts Initiatives. Um, you've been with us from the very beginning when we first started looking for funding. Um, the Prince Klaus Fund as well, so thank you so much. And both FFAI and the Prince Klaus Fund are funding a lot of our artists. Um, and then we have the World Bank who helped us with our curatorial research, so thank you. The Hong Kong Arts Development Council is also supporting a lot of the Hong Kong artists, um, which is actually a big selection of artists in, in Nepal, and we're really excited to be hosting those works. Uh, the U.S. Embassy of Nepal, in Nepal, <clears throat> and the U.S. Embassy is supporting a lot of artists who are doing work around community and public programming, so thank you so much. Um, we have the Sara Foundation, uh, who has a special grant that they've opened up and who are supporting three of our artists as well. So thank you so much. Um, and they're, they're, we're actually also showcasing some of the work from the Nepal Architecture Archive through the work with some of these artists. The Durjoy Bangladesh Foundation, who's making it, Durjoy, uh, the foundation is making it possible for the Kathmandu Triennale to travel to Berlin. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we have the Swiss Arts Council, Pro Helvetia, 
uh, Delhi, Shanghai, and Switzerland, thank you so much. The amount of support has been amazing. Um, the Australia Council for the Arts, uh, which has been a, a huge support to have artists coming <clears throat> from the Pacific Islands as well. Italian Council, um, thank you. Uh, along with the Italian Council, Direzione Generale Creatività and Contemporanea. <laughs> the Art South Asia Project. Um, thank you for believing in the need for us to network within the South Asian region and to learn from each other in terms of the technical aspects of pulling off something like this, so the art ecosystem. The Alliance Francaise and the Institut Francais, thank you so much for supporting the artists from France or are based in France. Um, we have the UN Women that supported the artists with the, <clears throat> the women artists uh, who are working with the Mithila work, the mural work that's in Tharagao Museum at the, at the moment. British Council for supporting the work that Yuri Rollo was doing uh, from the ADF grant. The Goethe Institute, Max Miller Bowen, um, thank you for such trust in our work. Um, the delegation of the European Union, and we have Her Excellency um, Nona de Presis here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, and for the, the, the delegation of the European Union is specifically supporting the educational work that we're doing at the Triennale. Um, the Nepal Tourism Board, um, thank you for supporting and believe in it, believing in us in past editions as well. Um, IFA from Germany, Saha from Turkey, thank you, um, who's supporting the artist's work. Uh, UNESCO uh, for supporting our curatorial research in Janakpur. And we have Chaudhary Group and the Unnati Culture Village, Chaudhary Foundation, Chaudhary Foundation um, for the kind of support you're giving in terms of the technical work. Uh, in terms of the screens and audio. That is absolutely essential for showing the work that we have with many, many artists. Um, Gore Kaburi and Summersby, thank you from the very beginning. You were one of our first funders uh, from the corporate sector. We really appreciate it and it was a large amount. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Mine Art that's providing technical support in terms of uh, the kind of venue mapping that we were doing. Uh, Toyota and supporting Pasita Abad's work. Um, and we have our patrons who are, have individually supported the work that we are doing as well. Shane Aykroyd, Sangeeta Thapa, who um, in addition to the actual foundation has also put her own um, investment into it as well. Spring Workshop, thank you for the residency work. Uh, William Lim, Sun Pride Foundation, Katie Dottili and Claire Shu, thank you so much. Uh, we have our venue partners. So, a lot of our venues have either completely fully, like the Tharagao Museum has completely allowed us uh, free of charge, but we also have a lot of the other spaces that have been giving us a huge discount. Um, and you know, it's this kind of support that allows us to show the exhibition for a whole month. So we have the Siddhartha Art Gallery, uh, Tharagao Museum, Patan Museum, Nepal Art Council, and the Bahadur Shah Baitak. Uh, which is a slightly newer space, and we're really excited that we'll be able to show the, the works in that space as well. And each of these works, um, our, our artistic director and our curators will be sharing more about. Um, a special thanks to the ne Nepal Academy of Fine Art, who made it possible for the partnership with the ministry to actually move forward. Um, so thank you very much. And the Rubin Museum of Art uh, for the kind of trust in our work that you have also given. Thank you so much. Um, we also have numerous partners and which this, this list is going to continue to grow. Um, so in, at the current moment, I'd like to recognize the Mobile Library Nepal. Um, we are visual identity by workshops uh, and our institution partner, Savi Contemporary in Berlin, where the works will be traveling uh, in June. There will be a show there in June. Our design partner, Six Was Nine, um, who are based in Nepal. Our web developers, Curves and Colors. Uh, our documentation partner, Katari. Our PR partner, Flint. Our 3D visual documentation partner, uh, Visualize VR or Semantic Creation. Our studio, Revere, has supported and helped us with some of the 2D and 3D mapping that we've been doing. Uh, our education partner is Susan Alaya. Our travel partner, Social Tours. Our production support for Trevor Young uh, of New Ventures, thank you for giving um, some of the materials that were needed. Um, our hotel partners, Yakanyeti, Hyatt Regency, and Traditional Stay. So please do come and stay in these when you're here. 
Um, our international airlines partner, Turkish Airlines, thank you very much for constant support throughout each of our, <clears throat> each of the different versions of the exhibitions, the Triennale. Our national flag carrier, Nepal Airlines, our paint partner, Berger, thank you. Our media partners, Nepal Traveler, um, we have Sofaj, which is the Society of Fine Arts Journalists in Nepal, Ocula, uh, and we have production support for Nafus Ramirez uh, from Traveling Jade as well. Thank you very much uh, for giving us those plants, which the work will not be anything without. Um, and then in addition to all the supporters and patrons, uh, I, we really wanted to emphasize that something like the Triennale can only happen with a large team of people who are supporting it. Uh, no one person can actually make something like this happen. So we have the head of communications and development, Apurva Rajagopal. We have the manager, Luniva Sakya, the head of exhibition design, Virangana Solanki, our accountants, which are so important, and administrators, Vinod Bujel and Sandan Shasta. Um, his name is missing from here. We have our production managers, or actually our production co our team co leads, Deepak Lama and Suresh Maharjan, um, and our curatorial team. So Dipti Sherchan, Jagdish Moktan, Sanjeev Maharjan, Sedon Tenzing, Sedon Ukyab, Urmila Gamwa Tharu, and Suresh Maharjan, and sorry, and Urmila. So our five curatorial team <coughs> members. And then we have our exhibition design team. So while we don't have images here, uh, throughout the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing Meet the Team, uh, you know, and, and live footage of some of their works in the exhibition venues. So we have our exhibition design team in all of the five venues, right? So Patan Museum and Badusha Baitak, we have Subash Tamang, Puja Maharjan, Danish Maharjan, Ruby Maharjan, Sarah Tunich Koinch, Susan Beer Bazasarya, Lakshmi Tamang. At the Nepal Art Council, we have Matina Maharjan, Hitesh Vaidya, Aman Shahi. At Siddhartha Art Gallery, Vinod Adhikari and Rashna Bazasarya. At Taragaon Museum, we have Vishal Yonzan, Kamal Shrestha, Susan Shrestha. And we have a multimedia technical coordinator, Nishal Kharga. And for some of the logistics and research work, uh, we have Shriti Prajapati, who's been taking care of the storage space, along with Ibustuti Thapa, uh, who is also a researcher. Um, and we have Pragya Thapa, who is our logistics coordinator as well. So this is, uh, gives you a sense of the team. Um, and we have over 100 artists who we will be introducing over the next few weeks. Um, so I'm going to sort of leave it with that. And I'd actually like to hand things over at this point in time um, to our artistic director, uh, Cosmin Kostanas, and to our co-curators, uh, Kilasha Rajbandari and Hitman Gurum. And we'd really like to hear, I think, you know, what we're all working for, you know, and, and what are we about to see and what is the vision that we're working towards. So I'd really like to hand it over to you, and I, I feel very honored to be able to hand it over to you. And I, um, it has been a pleasure to see you work and to see the way that this has been developing. So over to the three of you now. Thank you, uh, Shararaji. Uh, it's indeed like a, a very emotional moment to be uh, at this moment of, of, of launch and, and uh, at the, at the very last step before actually opening uh, the, the Triennale uh, physically to the uh, audiences on the 1st of March. Um, one can only start by uh, with gratitude in this moment. So um, I am really, truly grateful for, the, uh, for this incredible journey um, to all of you, uh, to Songita Ji for uh, her vision and for uh, her tirelessness in stewarding this process uh, um, over the past few years together with us. And of course, for the longer period of time um, that uh, of the of the of the Triennale's lifetime, and to Shararaji for your uh, extremely hard work and support and you know spirit of dedication and 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 um, uh, brightness that shows that everything can be uh, can be done, um, and um, of course a a, a huge. Um, 
you know, sisterly uh, gratitude to my colleagues, Shilasha Ji and Hitman Ji, uh, with whom we've um, um, brought to life, I think, the different ideas, the different um, interests, the different curiosities, the different uh, <laughs> Uh, strands of, of, of imagination that we each had uh, in different um, um, uh, processes of thinking and of working uh, over the past years. And it has been a truly, truly enriching um, experience to weave this together. So um, uh, this has been really like one of the most uh, unique uh, um, moments of collaboration in, 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 in my entire life. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to the entire team, uh, which indeed, uh, you know, made this uh, uh, entire process possible. Um, uh, it's really uh, um, touching to uh, have this family who are uh, investing so much uh, in 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 of, of their time and energy and enthusiasm in making it happen and uh <clears throat> last but not least a big thank you to all the many many artists who have uh, put their trust in us and who, who have um showed patience um for the many uh for, for the yeah, already one can say many uh, delays that the world circumstances of the last two uh, years pushed us uh, towards um, thank you for this incredible like confidence um, and I think also um, um, uh, there's a thank you in order to the entire uh, arts community of, 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 of Nepal uh, who have uh, nurtured uh, this event for many years and uh, have nurtured us in, in particular through dialogue, through exchanges, through, through critical perspectives. And um, I think one of the uh, incredible uniqueness of the Kathmandu Triennale is the fact that, you know, it is a, um, an event that is rooted in the community and it is, uh, it, it, it belongs to the community uh, for it to um, uh, represent it, to see it, to contest it, uh, to uh, adopt it, to uh, enter into all sorts of like dialogues and debates. Uh, and I think this is ultimately what uh, art institutions are, 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 are for. So um, uh, I'll, 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 we're going to have a conversation with uh, Shilaf Taji and, and, and Hitman Ji, so we will um, uh, hear from you a little bit more already at the beginning. And then I think we'll just like to speak a little bit very generally about uh, the different themes and how they they, they unfold uh, uh, in the five venues, um, about the title, uh, which is not a theme, it's a little bit of an explanation of, of this process. And, and um, it started as a gesture and it continued uh, as a, as an as as an explanation of 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 of, of the COVID postponements, I think in a, in a uh, unexpectedly um, um, concise way. Um, but this will not be an introduction to the Triennale. Uh, it it is ultimately um, focused. Uh, the, the Triennale is ultimately focused on the work of the incredible artists that we are showing uh, there presence in space, in the incredible venues that we were uh, lucky to be able to uh, work in, uh, and in the way in which they also like unfold in the city and the social structure of Kathmandu. Uh, so uh, the actual introduction of the Triennale will have to happen uh, in space. And for the ones who will uh, not be able to uh, um, join us in Kathmandu, uh, there will be uh, virtual platforms that will, uh, to the extent to which this is possible, help introduce uh, the artistic and, and, and effort and the, the curatorial effort of the entire team in, in, in staging this show. So what we would like to do today would be just to offer um, uh, little teasers to, as, as we said before, to sort of uh, offer uh, spoons of the soup that will be, you know, shared together at the family dinner. Uh, uh, to be served from March 1st onwards. 
So, Sheila Shaji and Hidmanji, would you like to say a few more things for introduction? Um, yeah, you know, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to tell a story about how she survived the smallpox uh, and then how their grandparents had survived the earthquake. And then I used to wonder like what it might be. And then in 2015, we had a very bad earthquake and now we're, we, we got pandemic. And then I, now we're experiencing it collectively all around the world. I think we are in the time that this is the one of the most challenging time in the recent hum human history. And thank you all uh, for joining us here because in Tuanali, uh, this has been one of the, again, most emotional, uh, mentally, uh, uh, you know, like so much of thing going on, but also we kind of managed to, yeah, yeah, do it today, uh, launch it today, and we're really hoping to see you in person in, um, in March onward. Um, I guess we all are survivors. Many more of us got COVID and we survived, and let's celebrate our our life. And then, <laughs> but yeah, in the process, like, uh, you know, we collectively try to attempt, uh, uh, we have to rethink many things, no? Like, when in the, in the initial, initial phase, like, we're planning to have a more like community engaged program, collaborative attempt, no? Like a collective journey. But because of all this uncertainty, we have to rethink and redesign lots of things. Uh, so it's like a been kind of, you know, like process of what we're trying to do as an artist and also as a collective. Uh, so, yeah, but yeah, as a Silasaji and Kosminji mentioned, it's like a been kind of a memorial journey of our life. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and adding to uh, uh, the energy Kosminji, uh, shared like we would really really like to acknowledge first of all the community arts community here the artists who are the backbones of Nepali art ecosystem in fact the artist collective artist led initiatives the institutions and and thank you very much our core team we had started this journey from 2019 um, and Cosmin Jimmy us uh, and then the team member in different periods of time have came together, overlapped, we've traveled in different parts of Nepal and, and, and around. We have continued the journey with many people who have we have known for many, many years, for more than a decade, some of them. We've met new people in this journey and thank you all for being so patient with us. Thank you team for being so patient. Uh, we would like to share a little bit about uh, why we have Kathmandu Triannali 2077. Uh, Ruby, if you can share the screen. Um. Or we can, oh, okay. Thank you, Ruby. Yeah, so um, yeah, so it was a curatorial conscious decision to move away from uh, the, the identity that we had before, like uh, we had decided before, which was Kathmandu Triana late 2020. So it was a conscious decision to move away from that and have Bikram Sambat calendar, which is the official uh, calendar that Nepal government follows. Uh, which, uh, and then Triennale was supposed to happen in 2020, which was 2077 in 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 the calendar. We also acknowledge the fact that Nepal have multiple calendar systems and time counting time counting systems. Um, but yeah, it it also. But later on, uh, because of the pandemic, when we had to uh, uh, shift our timing from 2020, we decided to stick with 2077. Um, yeah, because it's like, uh, it's not only a single event for us, no? It's like a process uh, and 
it's also not about only the exhibitions uh, that's happening. Uh, it's it's a whole the process, all the research process, and all the collaborations we want to acknowledge. Uh, and also, uh, it's like uh, moving away from this bad, uh, you know, like 2020. Uh, it's like <laughs> bad omen of 2020. Bad omen of 2020. <laughs> but also playing around with a notion of time. Uh, the artwork we have in uh, Kathmandu Triannale, uh, the, we are, we're not thinking time in a linear way. We are constantly juggling around different times and parallel universes and past, present and future. Uh, where it was 2020 for the rest of the world in Gorgorian calendar, uh, we were in 2077. So it was kind of fun also in that sense. Yes. Um, Next, Kospinzi. Oh. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, the, I think the um, <clears throat> name and the year, um, the, the, this Kathmandu Triennale 2077 remained this, 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 um, this abstraction, uh, this um, um, suspended in time um, as, as, as a metaphor of our process and also like of the uh, dynamics of the world in the last two years of the of, of, of the pandemic. So, yeah, I, I think as 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 Hitmanji and Shilashaji mentioned, it, it it felt like the most appropriate uh, metaphor of uh, what we've uh, all experienced uh, collectively around the world, and what was meant to be um, 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 a gesture uh, in, 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 in the direction of decolonizing time counting and timekeeping and, and, and our uh, um, calendaristic references uh, became more than that, became also a, a description of this process indeed. Um, but, you know, thankfully we are not uh, suspended in time uh, anymore in, in many parts of the world. And we are very grateful that indeed this is taking the, the, the shape of a, of a real exhibition in space and time. So we would like to uh, introduce a little bit the five venues and what the, the, the different journeys that you can expect to see upon entering each one of them. Oh. And the first, so we, if we can see the map, on the next page, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, the, 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 the Triennale uh, unfolds on uh, across these five venues. So at Platan Museum and at the adjacent Badur uh, Shabaitak um, um, venue next to it, uh, at, at Nepal Arts Council and at the Siddhartha Art Gallery in its vicinity, uh, as well as the, at the Tarragon Museum, uh, both in the uh, uh, indoor, in the spaces of the institution, as well as in the surrounding park, which we used as a uh, as, as a garden, and we invited artists to actually plant. So, uh, if you go to the, if you go to the Patan Museum, uh, which is of course uh, an, an uh, incredible building, a UNESCO heritage uh, building, it was the seat of the Mala dynasty uh, between the 14th and the, and, and the 18th century. And it's a, uh, one of the most uh, prominent uh, um, museums of, of Nepal. So we're very grateful to be able to um, uh, work uh, in its venue as well. And um, the uh, artworks and the selection that, that, are, that are how there um, are our um, the, the effect of a, of a very important conversation that we've been having from the beginning uh, with, with, with my colleagues. And that was about trying to figure out in what way we can create in the space of an exhibition like the Trina, in the space of any exhibition, a horizontal platform that can display and negotiate different lineages of artistic vocabulary. How can um, um, particular genealogies of form um, that um, um, are, are, are um, 
that have de de developed independently and, and, and overlap and, and synchronize in this contemporary moment uh, mm. in, in, in many parts of the world, how can they be brought together? How can um, very different artistic languages and practices by uh, artists working in the institutionality of, of, what the, uh, of what internationally is known as the contemporary art system, um, be uh, in, in, in the conversation with artists working in specific uh, artistic traditions from the Poba painting of Nepal, from Ink um, painting uh, across this Asia, uh, to bar cloth making in, 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 in the Pacific. Um, and immediately within this conversation, it was also like very clear that uh, if we, uh, engage in this process of dismantling uh, the idea of, of a Euros Eurocentric canon and, and of a single art history. Um, it's also important to um, unfold different relations of power that can happen uh, in, 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 in different knots uh, of, 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 of these encounters. So it was also important to acknowledge practices uh, that uh, are being left completely outside of, of any form of artistic discourse. How within Nepal, for example, you know, Poba painting, which itself, you know, uh, has been marginalized um, from a uh, Western centric idea of, of, of art history. Um, there are practices by indigenous communities, uh, practices often done by women, uh, practices done by uh, uh, in, 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 in various communities in, in, in society that uh, are themselves marginalized, even outside of the royal lineage uh, of, of, of patronage of, of, of and, 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 and the religious patronage of, of, of Poba painting. So how can these different levels of, um, of power dynamics, of, uh, of, of, of uh, social exclusion, um, be discussed through the visual and uh, artistic expressions that have been creating a, a, a long and produced alongside these groups and, and their tensions. Um, so we used the, um, the, the uh, most prestigious, uh, historically speaking, venues of, of, the, of the Triennale, the royal seat of the, of, of the Pattern Museum to uh, carry out this conversation. And um, um, I think that particular part of the exhibition is uh, probably the most uh, unusual. It's also one that, that has unexpected moments of harmony and, and uh, as well as moments of confrontation um, uh, between works, between their, the histories behind them, between the communities that, that um, uh, uh, represent uh, the context of, 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 of uh, uh, of these objects. Um, specifically, like a certain part of it is, is, is looking, for example, at different histories of medical imagination um, and how the, the plurality uh, of, of, of imagining uh, the idea of medicine, uh, which is very much connected to how we understand the position of self and, and the, and the, and the the, the um, many aspects of the functioning, uh, the interior functioning, the social functioning uh, uh, of the self. Um, um, so this is one of the sections that you can encounter at the, at the, at the Pattern Museum. Um, but again, this is not an introduction, it's not a guided tour, uh, virtual or otherwise. So it's, it's meant to be just a teaser. So I think we can move to the, to the next venue. Um, um, so Bahadur Shah Baitak is right next to, located right next to Patton Museum. And this is a very uh, historically important uh, place in a way because it's shaped uh, the current map of Nepal. Prithvi uh, Naran Shah, who has a very contradictory position in Nepal uh, in terms of um, 
because because uh, a lot of indigenous community uh, consider him as a conqueror, a colonizer, whereas other communities consider him as a unifier. Um, so his son Badu Shah uh, continued his expansion project uh, of what is now Nepal. Um, so Badu Shah Baitak was the space, uh, was this was this Baitak where this strategy of expansion happened. It was built in 1790. Uh, um, mm. um, and therefore, because um, uh, it, 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 was a, is a, it was a very military space, there was an arsenal behind, there was a, the, it has a gate where like war elephant could enter. Um, and then so curatorially, uh, we are sort of positioning artworks which talks about mapping. Yeah, the concept of mapping, not just the uh, geographical mapping or territorial mapping, but it, it also, you know, like go behind the map uh, or uh, counter the narration of idea of mapping, like mapping of universe or mapping of, you know, like bodies or yeah. mapping like a work or uh question the what is center and the periphery and also uh, yeah so the whole uh, the venue will hold uh, the artworks which will you know like uh, have a discourse about the ideas of mapping uh, yeah the map map uh, mapping our own uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. bodies uh, uh. But also, so, like for us as a curator, Cosmin Zisilasa and we, were, we had this continuous uh, discussion about uh, for us, these venues are not just a physical venues, you know, to exhibit the artworks, but uh, how it play, you know, like uh, important uh, meaning for making exhibition in this specific historical venues. And how can we, you know, like uh, know more about these venues at the same time? How can we look uh, look uh, on these venues as a, you know, like as a curator, as a exhibition maker? Yeah. So I mean, also at the same time, really trying to decolonize the idea of navigation, uh, the map, the understanding. Uh, the materiality of itself. So we are trying to acknowledge the indigenous technologies, um, and then really, really trying to sort of reject uh, the canon, uh, uh, the European uh, worldview in a way. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, we can move to another. So Nepal Art Council is one of the, you know, like most important art space in Nepal, uh, which was established by one of, like one of the pioneer modern artists, uh, Lansing Bandil in 1962. And uh, now it's become like a permanent uh, exhibition space uh, in Kathmandu. And it's also located in a very, you know, like uh, next, just next to very politically charged uh, a space called uh, Mandala, uh, Mighty Girl Mandala, where lots of, you know, like uh, politically charged event, uh, event take place. And also lots of people come there to, uh, you know, like have their voice, uh, like they, they will do their protests and maybe not uh, because, so the nation will, hear them, no? hear their issues. So, and also it's also very publicly accessible space. Uh, so most of the artworks this venue will hold, uh, it's more about the social-political issues, uh, the uh, history of resistance of different communities, uh, feminist issues, uh, queer and feminist issues, uh, and, and while we are very uh, consciously uh, uh, talking about the the colonial histories, uh, we are also very aware uh, to point out the hierarchy of casteism and patriarchy, um, and then how, especially in the region, uh, how that hierarchy 
particularly marginalized certain communities with artistic lineages, um, uh, for example, a lot of indigenous communities, but uh, Dalit communities. So, communi uh, so people who were practicing uh, yeah. making materials, practicing art, doing performance, singing, were placed in the most bottom line. Uh, were placed, were, 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 were uh, segregated as untouchables, were segregated as machinia uh, matwali uh, in the civil code, which means uh, the community who drinks alcohol and can, can be um, enslaved uh, or, or killed in a way. Um, so there are activist artists who are very who are trying to reclaim uh, these positions, who are trying to question the power, who are trying to uh, uh, consciously very uh, decolonize the internal colonization as well. Uh, but also again, within, uh, we, within the margins are also the margins. So that we are also talking about margin uh, within the margins. Um, with the, uh, so we have, artists who are talking about the hierarchy within the genders. Uh, 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 um, or, or countering this, you know, like this very strong patriarchal system or structure. And also uh, lots of artworks that reflect on, uh, because of, uh, you know, like this long political instability and also uh, natural catastrophe, how, Lots of people have been uh, displaced or migrated to, you know, or uh, mig migrating for the jobs or uh, unemployed issues. Uh, yeah. And and something they are encountering, they're facing, uh, which was never their fault. Uh, and and, and there's this larger uh, systematical problem, which is. Uh, uh, which trickle down to individual and their families, and then how they have to sort of mobilize and have to be displaced. Uh, but also, uh, while we are acknowledging uh, the lineages, while we're acknowledging uh, uh, the and reclaiming uh, the cosmologies and different genealogies, uh, also we have uh, friends who are trying to imagine the future and imagine the future 40,000 years after where they're still thriving uh, with their identities, where, which in the present uh, is, is not the case maybe, but trying to imagine that and, and collectively maybe that can happen. Yeah, so it's not just talk about the present or you know, the past, it's whole the past, present and future in a way. Okay, next. Um, so Siddhartha Art Gallery is interesting because the uh, uh, organizer of Kathmandu Triyanale is Siddhartha Art Foundation and Siddhartha Art Foundation has roots. It started as Siddhartha Art Gallery in 1987 as exhibition space uh, and the founder was two women, uh, Sangita Thapa um, and an artist. Uh, so, so, sorry. <laughs> um, so these two women started the space um, and then it evolved into uh, a foundation and foundation uh, started the festival and then this is the fourth iteration of Triannale. Uh, in Siddhartha Art Gallery, uh, we have artists who are reflecting uh, through different materials and mediums. Uh, like how human beings have been pushed and then how uh, they are, are kind of living together with the nature. And then, and then these artworks really sort of uh, reflects upon how ephemeral our existence is. Um, and then we have works uh, of artists from Nepal who uh, reflected through a micro level uh, of a very personal experience of 2015. <coughs> where they have uh, lost their loved ones, but also through a macro perspective where a larger 
uh, like heritage sites were destroyed and how that sort of la when, when such larger landmark kind of collapse then what kind of uh, 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 effects it gives to our collective consciousness, but also artists similarly talking about uh, loss uh, in other parts of the world uh, and a similar uh, uh, situation of crisis with nature. So lastly, in terms of like venues, the Tarragon Museum, um, which um, has also been one of uh, uh, our uh, partner uh, institutions uh, on the ground. And um, it's um, an institution with a very interesting contemporary art program as well as with an archive that, uh, that, that looks at, a, at an entire 20th century um, history of, of, of um, heritage preservation in, in, in Nepal, but actually has a lot of like very interesting gems um, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a treasure trove for, for, for researchers. Um, within the Tarragon Museum, which is also like located in, 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 in a park, we um, were primarily interested in looking at gardens uh, as, um, as many things, uh, gardens as uh, both metaphors and reality for the climate uh, and, and uh, you know, because uh, urgency of our time and, and, and uh, the climate crisis, but looking at gardens from various angles as well, gardens as uh, a site of colonial exploitation uh, uh, as, as, as sites where um, um, everything from agriculture to the designing of, of, of gardens and to the, um, to, uh, the um, uh, understanding of, 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 of the seasonality of gardens uh, is reflective of a worldview. So this leads to the idea of gardens as images of the world, as, as, as uh, uh, visions of perfect worlds, of, of utopian world, worlds, uh, visions of the world as it is uh, at, at, at the same time. Um, so um, um, that also means that gardens were sites of resistance as well. And through planting, through, uh, through um, uh, modifying at the micro level of a garden, uh, leading us to a proposition for uh, changes that could happen on a, on, on, on a pla planetary levels. So yeah, all these sort of like different metaphors and realities uh, of, of, of the space of the garden can be found at the, at the Tarragon Museum. Again, both inside the exhibition spaces as well as in the sort of like new gardens that, that, that we created around, around it. Um, yes, so these are the five uh, venues of the Triennale. I, I'm very warmly inviting all of you to uh, visit us. Um, uh, for the ones who uh, won't be able to come to Kathmandu, we will uh, prepare uh, you know, uh, the pair copy that the 3D uh, navigation system uh, is uh, in, in comparison to the real thing. Um, the Triennale itself and, and uh, well, continues in the next uh, weeks until the, the 1st of March through an online program that will be equally intensive during the, the, the duration of the exhibition as well. And, and that was something that actually has happened through the Kurakani series uh, since almost the beginning of our research. So we, 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 we conducted the research also through uh, these public moments um, uh, that happen on a, on a uh, monthly basis when, when, when the pandemic situations allowed us to. Um, we are also like working Besides the exhibition catalog that will be uh, available at the opening, we're also working on a more complex publication on a book that we will be uh, launching uh, at the opening of uh, the Berlin version of the exhibition in, 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 in June um, that will be um, um, 
I think a, a major platform for artists and researchers uh, and, and critics and thinkers uh, from Nepal and from around the world to explore some of the same interests that we had uh, with, with the exhibition. Um, one of the lines of programs throughout the, the Triennale will actually be to have you know, conversations with many of the authors. Uh, I think before we move towards that, I think we would like to open nevertheless the platform to for potential questions if there are uh, at this point uh, for you know all of us who've introduced the triennale and for the for the curatorial team. I think it would be good to to to, to leave this moment now uh, in case there are any questions. So uh, please either announce yourself or, or or leave the question in the in the comment section. Um, <clears throat> there will be. Uh, or Kosminji, can we address that later? Um, well, I think that if there are questions for us, there should be now. That's what we said. I think later there will be like questions, of course, for the speakers of the panel. So if there are any questions for the uh, for, for us about the Triennale, uh, which right now the. Um... The most of the messages have been congratulations. So thank you so much um, for that. But I think maybe what we can also do is please feel free to put in your questions in the, on both of Facebook Live. So everybody who's joined on Facebook Live as well, thank you for being here with us um, on the Zoom link as well. Thank you. And please continue to ask us questions. Um, and just a reminder that 11th to the 28th is online only discursive programs. And then from the 1st to the 31st of March, our venues are open, um, which is a miracle. Um, so please do come, uh, like Cosme and Shilash and Itman are saying, you know, please do come. I, I think things are starting to open up <clears throat> and things actually on the ground in Nepal, uh, as long as you're vaccinated, um, you know, no quarantine. So please do come. Uh, but yeah, so just a little bit of time to let questions come through, but it looks like we're okay for the moment. So maybe we can move into the Kiti Kurakani uh, series. So actually I'll hand it back to you all. Um, would you guys like to introduce the speakers? Yes. For the Kiti Kurakani. Actually, one thing I, I, I did forget to say was just thank you to all the collectors as well, not just for, for lending all the works as well. So that's something that I didn't say before so I wanted to make sure I said that but go ahead um, maybe handing it over to you guys to maybe introduce the next section which will be conversations yeah thank you Shalariji so uh, we're moving to the second part of the evening with that we said that you know besides our own introduction and you know the uh, flimsy teasings that we were offering that we wanted to already start by offering, uh, you know, real content as well. So uh, we have invited uh, three speakers who will all be contributors to the publication as well. And, you know, uh, they also have worked uh, with the Triennale in other capacities as well. So, you know, we're, we're all wearing dif different hats in, 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 in bringing this Triennale to life. Uh, but I would like to introduce the first uh, speaker of the, the, the evening, Priyanka Priyahar Badur, Badur Chand, who uh, is a um, uh, historian, an anthropologist, uh, uh, a public health expert, uh, and, and, and the thinker um, who uh, tries, I think, very originally to uh, work at the intersection of these very disparate uh, fields. Um, um, and he's also a co-founder uh, of the uh, Sickle Cell uh, Nepal, um, uh, a, a nonprofit uh, which works to improve the access to health services uh, for for patients of the of, of this genetic blood blood disorder. Uh, he also uh, uh, is 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 carrying out different. Um, and research and works in the uh, recent art history of, of uh, art history of Nepal. Uh, so um, uh, he's uh, active in different fields and different uh, uh, from different perspectives. That also actually like led us to invite him to write not one but two texts for the publication from two very different perspectives. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Priyankar to 
speak. Um, and then with Priyankar is collaborating with Nimado Dibhutia. And I'm glad to introduce Nimaji. Nimaji is a researcher at Social Science Baha in Kathmandu, where he's involved with Sajag Nepal, a project assessing mountain hazards and rick chain. Uh, his personal long-term archival work explores the Walunga community of Upper Tamar Valley in Nepal, particularly looking at um, how marginal communities situated at frontiers negotiate changing dynamics within nation state and global sphere. Uh, welcome Priyankarji and Nimaji. Yeah, the floor. Okay. Thank you for those kind introductions. I'll just share my screen. Uh, so thank you for the to the organizers as well as to Cosmin for introducing. I think the more uh, I was a curatorial assistant for the Triennale and the more I did research, I felt like I wasn't an expert on anything. Uh, and we'd also like to say hello to all the friends and familiar faces who've joined us from all over. Nima and I are going to give a short presentation that we've titled Notes on Methodology or Not on Methodology or How to Avoid Textual Temptations. I think over the course of this particular presentation, uh, we are aiming to frame texts more as metaphors for mainstream or conventional narratives that are often suppressed or overpowered other type of vernacular or underlying narratives that uh, one can see in Nepal. Particularly while both Nima and I do a lot of social science research in different areas of Nepal and trying to contextualize the type of challenges we face as researchers. Uh, the other point we'd like to make is we'd like to thank, uh, I think, literally the hundreds of individuals we spoke to, we interviewed, who gave us their time to teach and talk about the many different artistic practices, histories and contexts of Nepal so that we could make sense of it to present to all of you. Uh, to begin the presentation is this image of the conquered enchantress by the artist Dedron, whose work, whose reproduction of this work is uh, presented in the Triennale. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, this particular image represents Srinmo, who's a demoness as well as a goddess in Tibetan oral traditions. And Within that oral tradition, Dedron's body is supposed to be the body upon which different institutions in Tibet are literally built. So that means that various monasteries as well as other Buddhist institutions were built on different parts of her body. Uh, metaphorically, we thought this aptly represented firstly the uh, institutional narratives that lie above different types of vernacular, uh, vernacular positionings and ideas that exist. Uh, particularly as a researcher in Western Nepal, both in the Tarai as well as in the hills of Western Nepal, uh, often I don't find literature concerning many of the things that I'm researching. And often I rely on a lot of uh, local narratives to try to make sense of these things. Uh, I'd like to ask Nima to continue from here. And could someone also help mute any background noise or uh, to mute themselves if they're not presenting? It's kind of difficult to present. Thank you. Um, the link to all. Um, uh, can you change the slide? Um, change. Yeah. So, um, as Prankar was mentioning about the you know different narratives uh, um, on that you know she was built on. Uh, in terms of my own um, academic research and my own readings of the matter, I tend to study my own community. Sometimes I did, I found this gap in terms of like you know um, scholarship narrative which does not um, looked into uh, other kind of scholarship. Uh, for instance, say I um, mean you know if you looked into Himalayan research, there is no mentions or, or rarely mentions in terms of uh, pre Buddhist or or Bon or Shangchung civilizations. So um, these kind of challenges um, um, also open me to the opportunities to look um, into other aspects of research, uh, for instance, archiving, you know, archiving non-textual um, materials to uh, better understand uh, what I'm trying to understand in terms of my community. So uh, I, yeah, to give you a context where I do research, I 
I do research in uh, Ulang Chungula, which is my home um, village, um, which we call Walung. So hence, but uh, I'll be using Walung rather than Ulang Chungula uh, when I'm talking about. So uh, as you see, uh, to just give you a bit, glimpse of what I'm trying to do, uh, uh, what kind of method that uh, helps me to understand my community better. Uh, I have these two pictures of uh, Abacus and, and Demag, uh, which Demag is more of um, you know, vernacular uh, calculating device, whereas Abacus is more of very cosmopolitan, um, uh, is widely used a kind of calculation device. So usually Walung or Himalayas are always considered as a, as a margin or isolated. So, but then this kind of, you know, devices uh, that are simultaneously used in Walung tell something different stories about the connectivity. And, and so forth. So um, in, in this uh, presentation, I'll be talking about my archiving and what the challenges or what the opportunities that I, um, I, I encountered through the process. Next, Yinka. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think to continue with what Nima brought up in terms of archiving and particularly to think about how different types of archives are put together in Nepal. Uh, I've been working with um, artists and activists in Dutharu as well as uh, artists Lovkan Chaudhary over the past few years to uh, archive and document the works of Chokhan Rathaya who was a Maoist revolutionary as well as the father of Indutharu. And what is really interesting when putting together these series of documents on Muktik Tagar, which means the path of liberation in Tharu, uh, was that the ways in which this particular publication addressed uh, various issues of Nepali society concerning feudal oppression, uh, oppression from the state, Tharu rights to language as well as land, uh, was very creative. Often within this publication, you'll find songs, poetry, you'll find readaptations of oral traditions to address contemporary issues. And there's a multitude of languages that are used to address contemporary societal issues. Uh, unfortunately, when we think about archives, we often feel like uh, it's for objects that are uh, maybe a few, a few hundred years old or uh, rather distant from our present day, but even for publications that are released in the year 2000, it's quite difficult to come across certain publications. For example, it took us nearly two years to find this particular uh, text and also to find someone who was willing to let us digitize and scan it. Uh, often when you're talking about magazines that were uh, intentionally persecuted by the state and when you're thinking about individuals who were also persecuted. And when you're also trying to find publications and resources that are from the border areas or frontiers of Nepal, it's there, there hasn't been any systematic effort to assemble or to make sense of these type of issues. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll start with that. So uh, now the challenges that I face in terms of, um, you know, try to understand my community and then how, you know, those who are not, you know, out of the community understand or try, you know, kind of, you know, stereotypical understandings were constructed. Um, in, in year 2015, I accompanied this uh, group of Yapa um, to Tibet uh, on a trip where they, they went to buy stuffs for the, um, themselves or, or for the business. So um, while traveling there, I kind of like realized in a sense, like, you know, how our communities were understood in a sense that, you know, usually they were looked through the prism of barter system as, you know, people um, see yak as a pack animal, which is something of outdated, you know. But then when I was there, when I saw the book, um, commodities that they were trading or they were buying or, or nature of change, you know, that that are not reflected in the way we are, our community and Walung itself is understood um, in, a, in, a, in a larger sphere. So um, another point that I wanted to highlight as well is that, you know, our community or Himalayan communities are sometimes, um, you know, understood only through the geographical uh, location they are in. Uh, which uh, kind of deconstruct, contextualize how these people have um, moved out of their um, native land and travel far and wide. In my own community's case, uh, first they move out to out to the hills of Nepal and then to cities of Nepal, uh, um, whether it be Kathmandu or Darjeeling, and to cosmopolitan city like New York. So you know, without understanding a community, uh, you know, 
only taking that community through that geographical um, space kind of misconstrue or decontextualize uh, uh, these people and their understanding. And in addition to the mobility of peoples, under the other point that's really important that I think is also being highlighted in the Chianale is the mobility of ideas and the fluidity of ideas. Uh, this is particularly stark when we were conducting research on traditions of tattooing in the Tarai areas of Nepal, uh, tattooing as it's known as Ngodna or Chedna in the Tarai and primarily practiced by many indigenous communities, including the Tarus, uh, is a varied art form. And what is interesting for me, particularly given my background in medical anthropology and public health was that uh, I had conducted research on a disease, sickle cell disease for many years and a primary aspect and symptom of the disease is pain. So individuals can feel sudden bursts of pain. And I'd spoken to doctors and patients in medical and clinical situations about how they understood, managed and conceptualized pain. Uh, however, I'd never really researched on other aspects of understanding and seeing pain. And one of the examples that we came across is that in addition to aspects of tattooing for adornment, our practices of tattooing and tattooing for healing. And that almost like almost as a practice similar to acupuncture. So tattoos can be made on parts of the body where an individual experiences pain. Over here, uh, you see an image of a uh, chani, which is a sieve on the palm of an individual's hand. And while we are speaking to an artist, Jagmati Devi Tharu in Hasulia, which surprisingly is also the same area and vicinity around which the publications such as Muktik Dagor is being put together, she sort of explained to us how uh, when you feel pain and you want to create a tattoo to heal pain, you sort of visualize the pain itself. So if you're feeling a circular form of pain, you'd make a chani, which is a circular shape. If you're feeling, for example, a lower back pain that was a severe linear like pain, you draw a straight line. And if you're feeling pains on certain joints in the body, you would make a cross mark or a dokta as it's known in Tharu. So it is very fascinating to see that there's an entire language uh, around pain and its visualization, particularly in a community where pain historically would have been something that affected hundreds of individuals. And I think what is furthermore interesting in explanations about uh, visual practices, which can be seen uh, in practices throughout Nepal is that uh, the, the terminology that was used was chitra lekhno, which in English would be to write a painting. And in this particular example, where Lok Chitraka, who's a renowned Pova artist, is uh, drawing these lions to heal a skin disorder, uh, similar type of la language is used to describe paintings as writing. And even when we were speaking about different practices of Tika Chitna, uh, the word Naksa was used, the word uh, Lekhnu was used, the word Chitra was used. So words such as mapping, writing and drawing are often interchangeable and fungible when people are describing uh, such concepts. However, when we see scholarship or writing in general, uh, this fluidity and fungibility of ideas is almost absent and uh, a priority is given to a certain type of narrative. And I think within the social science researchers of Nepal, uh, such diversity and such complexities of visual languages are often absent. So, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, the art form or art form practices in Himalaya, you know, Buddhist iconographies or Buddhist religious iconographies are too prominent where, you know, uh, there's a less of a study in terms of uh, uh, everyday art or in that sense. Uh, here, I have this uh, image, uh, which we call Yakpar. Um, it's, it's instead a uh, stencil art form that uh, is practiced in my community. So, um, I try to kind of understand, uh, you know, this art form and you know, try to dig into how this came into practice, or, or you know, kind of, you know, try to explore who are the, you know, people behind this, or whether there's a people who can still do this kind of, you know, cut the fresh stencil. But you know, as I travel to different places around Walu or to Tibet, I didn't find, I mean, um, similar practices uh, in those places, uh, which which you know, kind of does not give me uh, any 
um, sense of clear idea where did it come from, but then definitely it's something tells about the connectivity or, or, or interaction that the community has. And luckily, I mean, like, you know, it is still being practiced, but, you know, in the community, there's no one who can freshly cut a stencil, stencil art of this form. So what people have been doing is they've been using the old, um, you know, sample to cut the new stencil uh, to, to decorate their houses uh, um, during a festival, or, you know, before the festival, whether it be Losa or other major festival that we celebrated in Walu. So similarly, I mean, food also became another um, slide. Food, food also became another a viable I mean, side to understand my own community. As you all know that, you know, rice is something not stable to Himalaya or, or to high, high Himalaya. So um, to my community, uh, rice was uh, one of the most, you know, high value community that um, my community historically traded and make fortune out of it. And also um, rice, Rice as a community, Walung well, also borrowed the cell root practices uh, and it became a delicacy, especially made uh, during uh, major festivals. Uh, uh, as far as my interviews with the people who had, you know, um, who, were, who had a longer experience of living within the community, also shares how rice becomes sometimes a marker of you know, class, you know, when traveling, sometimes if you don't have a say you are mixing rice with the corn, then you know, people who own a rice, who, who eat a rice without mixing with any other grain will not cook with you. So uh, that, that was something interesting and, and, and it gave me a kind of a diverse way to understand my community uh, through non-textual uh, method. But uh, while speaking about, I think, the interconnectedness and the links between various groups in Nepal, there's still a preponderance to value uh, certain uh, areas or certain histories more than others. And I think when we are conducting research in Karnali, uh, this is in the district of Jumla in the Valley of Siza, we're trying to study the different forms of wooden sculptures that exist in the region. Uh, there's very little literature uh, on that subject. We spoke to a few of our friends who'd gone there to do uh, research prior, and particularly asking about artists who do such works. There's uh, one particular artist, Kalo Tirwa, who's known for his representations of like uh, the former kings and queens of Nepal. And what was funny is that we, we were told in Kathmandu that the artist was dead. So we went with the expectation of not meeting anyone who could make the sculpture. And when we reached this particular bridge and started talking to a, a shopkeeper there, and in Nepali, the conversation was sort of like, uh, and uh, so what had happened was that we were under the presumption that the artist was dead and then the shopkeeper when we told him about the, the circumstances that we had known uh, corrected us and told us that actually the artist is well and alive and had just come to the shop and gone back to his village and uh, we were able to interview Kalo Tirwa and I think what is really important is that I mean, one, I guess it was sort of a miraculous happening in the sense that we got to meet someone who practiced uh, such an art form for quite a long time. And also someone who was able to contextualize and give us more information on his art practices. And I think what's really surprising is that there are hundreds of such artists all over Nepal whose uh, efforts are undervalued, uh, whose histories are not contextualized. And I think he brought a very important point that there isn't really a space to acknowledge or to see such varied forms of understanding history as well as uh, visual language in Nepal. And there's quite an important need for such spaces. Well, when talking about the space in terms of um, my own research, um, I found on social media over the year um, an interesting side to, I mean, to a you know, documentation. Um, and at, at the same time, you know, it's very uncertain in the long run that we might not be able to Kind of access this if you know Facebook fits are we already no more active right so what I did do is you know I I I am connected with the people as, as my community is small spread across the different location so to me it really works in terms of 
understanding things that I could not understand through my usual methods of doing research, interview, or, or, or any other methods that are more dominant in terms of carrying out research. So here I would like to share this um, two, um, you know, Facebook posts that um, I kind of documented. Um, one is more of, you know, the anticipations abroad um, that is supposed to connect Walung uh, so that, uh, you know, they can go to Tibet easily with the vehicle or down to district headquarters. Um, so this kind of, you know, collective aspirations can be um, documented through social media. Well, as whereas on the right is is is, is a is a post about you know how they used to call the national anthem when they were um, they were kids, especially this um, guy uh, senior guy from Walung, who were the groups of first group of people who uh, actually went to the government schools uh, in district headquarters, and and how they term it um, as a, as a government song rather than national anthem. Um, at the same time, and it, it also kind of highlights, uh, you know, how community remembers um, or remember past, you know, how uh, they recollect their memories uh, and, and share it uh, over the social media, which has a wider uh, social meaning or community meaning um, of the community. And I think particularly while doing uh, field research in Nepal, sometimes uh, very funny things happen. And you go out looking for something, but you end up finding something else uh, in, in the same valley as where the, where the previous bridge existed in Siza. Uh, there are a series of archaeological sites related to the Khas Malla Empire, uh, a dynasty that existed somewhere between the 11th to 14th centuries. And we were sort of looking for these uh, stone columns and pillars that had inscriptions from, well, nearly 500 years ago. Uh, we encountered some difficulty locating the site, particularly because the site had fundamentally changed from the last time it was photographed. Now there was this irrigation canal or kulo uh, built through it, and it was quite difficult to locate uh, these pillars. And the other thing was that some of them had been taken out of their uh, original positions and been repurposed. So this particular pillar to the left and to the right are the same. Uh, so it had been taken out and put over the Kulo, the irrigation canal as a bridge, so people could cross over safely. And on top of on top of it was an uh, inscription that read Bir Said Lal Salah, which is a ode to the Maoist revolutionaries from Nepal's conflict. And on the verse of it is actually a, a an inscription as well as images of Buddhist uh, symbols, uh, probably from 500 years ago. So you have two different two different inscriptions that are nearly 500 years apart, and then again uh, irrigation canal that was made last year, and then the object is taken out and then put on top of this uh, newer artificial structure, and instead of a pillar commemorating kings or the war, then it becomes a bridge. So I think. In Nepal, there are these layers of history and there's this layer of repurposing the past and memories itself that's very fluid and quite entertaining at times. And I think uh, like one has to see a lot of these objects and uh, practices and be open to the different forms of interpretations and encounters that, uh, that you can see in Nepal. And I think uh, we'd like to end on a slightly lighter note. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Nepali, I mean, this is a TikTok post that uh, somehow came to uh, my disposal uh, through friends. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, interestingly, this is a, a discussion of, of a, you know, the a house on a cell on a TikTok, which was circulated on a TikTok. So, you know, the price of house is 1.55 crores, but then the guy who come in is, you know, the house is nice, but then this you know, the land must be in Ulang Chungola, in, in Walung. So, you know, so this this is something like, you know, kind of, you know, how people see or how I try to, you know, um, bring my own kind of narrative in terms of this larger discourse or, or, or scholarship. I'll try to capital with myself in terms of where I fit within, within the scholarship. Thank you, um, this is it. Thank you, Priyankar and Nimaji. Uh, so we'll take all the questions.
your comments, thoughts after the presentation by Dipti. So I'm going to introduce my good friend Dipti. Uh, Dipti is a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her research interest lies at the intersection of anthropology, art history, and critical feminist studies. She is currently investigating the cultural politics of art institutions, uh, the cultural, cultural politics of art institution, nationalism, and the categories of Nepali art, artists, and art history in the 20th and 21st century of Nepal. Her project proposes re-examining art walls as a culturally and politically salient ethnographic site to explore issues of sovereignty, indigeneity, and belonging. So the floor is yours, Dipti. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, good friend Hitman <laughs> and, and Shilasa and everyone so far. Um, I will just dive directly into the presentation. Um, uh, hi everyone, I'm Dipti and, and obviously Hitman has already introduced me, so I'm not gonna repeat uh, what he said. For today, I'll be presenting some preliminary explorations that I embarked on during 2021 on the relationship between artists who grapple with their past, present, and futures, and the rather complex and multivalent notions of indigeneity. I'm afraid I have no definitions or theories to offer today. Uh, instead, I want you to think about the artists and artworks I'll be presenting today as doing that labor of theorizing their worlds. And my own frayed encounters as merrily plugged into this attempt. And I would of course encourage you to think along with me on these frayed equations. When did I first hear of Arzun Khalin? I'm not so sure anymore. Perhaps it was an exhibition or a conversation that led me to dwell on Khalin Sir. I definitely never met him and yet Khalin Sir body of work began haunting me. I told myself to be careful. This sort of critical fabulation is frayed for the lack of a better word or no fraud. It is definitely fraud. So when I met his brother who graciously gave me access to a hard drive full of folders and subfolders containing hundreds of images, I was not sure how to approach his Uber. These pastel preoccupations of an artist scribbling a figure of a shaman uh, provide access to a different kind of artistic labor, unlike a finished form of artwork. They transport you to the moment of thinking, gears churning, meanings being drawn and redrawn and drawn again. These rough sketches are telling you something intimate here. I'm trying to make sense of a world. A world equally enchanted and disenchanted by the passage of time, politics, and aesthetics. Culling Sir was thinking about aesthetics a lot. His rough notes show that he wanted to conceptualize and engage with the philosophy of aesthetic. And adding an adjective like indigenous or insert an ethnic identity here to aesthetic, uh, to many people might seem blasphemous or perhaps post-colonial, but is there a way to think think about aesthetic beyond the burden of the post-colonial critique. Without being pulled apart by the struggle to articulate what seemed to be embedded in your intimate experiences. Perhaps Culling Sir was haunted by this question too. Culling Sir was one of the founding members of Lalit Kalas uh, Kirat Lalit Kala Samaz or Kirat Fine Art Society, which is an organization established in the wake of the fervor of a newly federal Nepal, a renewed nation for all, a nation inclusive, a nation not just democratic, but republic. In the catalog for Kirat Lalit Kala Samaj's first exhibition held at the Nepal Art Council in 2009, Ratan Kumar Rai states, quote begins, the founding of the Kirat Fine Art Society must be seen in the light of the changed political and social cultural development from having a Hindu monarchical and or a despotic one party rule to an all encompassing secular federal system of governance in a state inhabited largely by indigenous ethnic groups. Thus proliferated Arjun Khaling's experiment with aesthetics. In contrast to the ambiguities 
end contradictions that have shaped the public discourse, including scholarly interviews on indigeneity with questions about who truly belongs to this land, what stakes are involved in claiming indigenous identities, and how does an inclusive federal state recognize indigeneity, Culling Sir's work offer a more grounded approach to thinking about it. The red Mackay plant potted on a mosaic printed gamala, casting long shadows onto concrete walls, Iskus and its vines taking over the pink canvas and a galaxy of chindos decked in intricate weaves. There's not much that I can add to this proclamation on indigeneity. Nature travels along with people, people travel along with nature and they make them their homes. Indigeneity is about discovering and at times rediscovering this home. But where is this home? How far into the past or forward slash into the future is this home? It is in this mind bending time space continuum that I find Shabazz Tebe Limbu's work firmly situated. In an article, Adivasi Futurism that Tebe penned himself, he writes, Adivasi is a Nepalese word for indigenous, but also widely used as collective term for indigenous people in Indian subcontinent. Among many names, we mostly use Adivasi Janajati, indigenous nationalities, for ourselves in Nepal. So for me, Adivasi futurism could be a space where Adivasi artists, writers, musicians, and filmmakers can imagine and speculate future scenarios from their perspective, where they have agency, technology, sovereignty, and also their indigenous knowledge, culture, ethics, and storytelling still intact of course, with upgraded codes. It could be an intersection where, where futures without or dealing on ways to delink and dismantle Brahmanical patriarchal casteism and racism that has been detrimental to Adivasis, Dalits, Madesis, women, and queer people in the region. All his words. So Adivasi futurism is tethered to a collective reclamation of not only one's past, but also futures. There is a capacious way in which Thebe treads on, treads on these difficult histories to suggest that indigeneity does not need to be conscripted by the boundaries and scales of time and space controlled by state practices and narratives, that there is a way forward, not out. Indigeneity is not a monolith, and yet the monolithic scale of Silam Sakma, the mothership in which indigenous people time travel, offers a provocation. What if the scale of indigeneity can hover over the scale of state capture? <laughs> In the book, Mapping Modernism's Art, Indigeneity and Colonialism, Harney and Phillips think of indigeneity as, quote unquote, a troubling term. It is troubling because it holds within itself historically contingent and at the same time dialogical and processual ways in which the contours of indigeneity is being shaped. They argue that, quote begins, the lack of integration of modern indigenous art histories into larger narratives is owed not to a dearth of research, but to its limited circulation within national and settler art historical communities as they come to terms with their colonial past. When I began this research on indigeneity in art, I was looking at some of the archival materials on the national art exhibitions organized by the Nepal Association of Fine Arts that came to life during the heyday of the Panchayati regime and patronage of the ruling class. Categories like modern, contemporary, traditional handicraft and folk began to emerge as this fixed, timeless, essential entities that circumscribed artistic practices. What is interesting is the stark absence of the term indigenous in these national exhibition catalogs, even at the turn of the 21st century. This is troubling, not because the national discourse on art is being exclusive, 
but in fact, it is troubling in a generative way. It makes explicit the very reason why the category of indigeneity is yet to be co-opted by national art institutions. It is because in doing so, it would have to reckon with the direct in disenfranchisement and displacement of indigenous communities from their land, their histories, and their memories. Make Limbu's body of work gestures towards these oppressive forces through a counter-cartographic retelling of the histories of his indigenous community. During a conversation, Make Thai tries to explain to me, Yuma chahi thunse boke ko budi, bozu, ani kurmi bhire ko hunsa re bhante, ani ghar ko tala mati pani tehi bozu hunsa bane ra, hami teha jana dar lakthiyo. Mali jamin sanga sambandit kaam gare ko le jamin sanga jodi ne sabi aunsa. Tesma taan thiyo ni, tiyo sanke tehi yuma nai ho. Ani tehi jamin la jodne samba, yeba, yema, fedang mahar ko mundhum le jod sa. His work evokes an uncanny feeling of familiar and ancestral, dreamlike and virtual. Indigeneity in his work is uncanny, ancestral figures, motifs, and ritual objects that float above the vast landscape of histories, narratives, and memories being retold. Can we also think about indigeneity and its relationship to art as generatively unsettling? I'm far too familiar with the confounding feeling of loss of something you've never really experienced yourself and yet seems so integral to your being to present to you an unbiased narrative on how a generation of young people in Nepal, especially those who belong to indigenous communities, make meanings out of their ancestral ties and disconnections. Even though nostalgia is often considered resonant with romanticizing and essentializing a certain kind of past, when compounded with actual loss of culture, knowledge, and memories, one is forced to reconsider the productive potential of nostalgia and artistic practices. 
It is in this politically charged ground of claims to authenticity and legitimacy that Sara Tunich Koint practices her art making. Her work grapples with this reality and in doing so also shapes her experience of indigeneity. Sara explains to me, and here I liberally paraphrase, this is actually called Kyong, sort of like mouth hop. It is similar to Murzunga. I should have brought one with me today to show you. In Kirati culture, this is often given as a gift to indicate that you like someone. And if that person accepts it, they pin it to their clothes. Sarah's work is proliferated with motifs and metaphors that present a different set of entanglements with indigeneity. One that is riddled with intergenerational experiences of loss and embracing of identity in a neoliberal consumer culture. She writes in her statement, culture has always fascinated me as it is directly related to the part of our daily life. I've been continuously trying to do research about my cultural roots and norms. Since I've been living in this urban city, these subjects have become more and more capturing to me and creating the sense of curiosity within me as urbanization represents this modern era and our cultural roots are being diminished. Quote ends here. Efforts towards self-determination through participation in cultural activities run parallel to a densely neoliberal capital system that promotes consumption of culture as part of being a neoliberal subject. State recognition and celebration of indigenous culture comes with risks of being tokenized. And of course, Sarah is fully aware of this conundrum. And so is Soni Bantawa, whose work Replacement portrays a young girl dressed in what is considered a culturally authentic dress beside a handloom used by her community and a mirror reflection of this image with trendy brands etched onto her clothes. The argument that artists like Sara and Sony are perhaps juxtaposing the tensions between tradition and modernity would fail to recognize the complexities of what Sony calls generational gap that I take to stand for a more analytically salient observation on how indigenous communities are experiencing time and space in contemporary times. The articulation of generation gap in Sara and Sony's work presents to us a cognitive dissonance of being both indigenous and contemporary. What, what happens when we experience our identity along the frayed lines of indigeneity and neoliberalism? Today, I have presented to you a series of encounters with artists whose works point towards critical articulations on indigeneity. To those who are familiar with Kaling Sir's work here, maybe you can see his iconic bozu with shades and converse shoes in Sony's young girl wearing Nike Tolo and trendy shoes or maybe Sarah's proliferating kyongs as part of the same cosmos as Kaling Sir's chindos. Or maybe you felt an uncanny resonance between Subasa's portrayal of Adivasi futurism and Mehdai's articulation of indigenous histories. And hope these have unsettled some thoughts. This is where I'd like to end my presentation. And thank you so much for listening to me patiently. Thank you so much uh, uh, to the all the three of you for your amazing uh, presentations and, and and I say that very uh, honestly and and um, uh, you know, truly impressive. Um, so I think we would like to open to the to any questions that there might come um, from the audience. We're very um grateful for the large number of people who are watching both on zoom and on facebook live um and there's been a lot of reactions of uh support and 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 of congratulations for our speakers um it might still be a bit of an awkward format for people to really ask questions and to to really have a proper conversation so i don't know if that will really happen but if there are questions nevertheless um alongside the praise uh please do ask them uh you can type them uh, i think you can also feel free to unmute yourself and, and 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 do it we can be a bit informal here um but uh 
you'll get the chance to uh, read uh, longer uh, versions of, of, of the talks and, 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 and actually like other thoughts by, by uh, all the three of them in the publication that we're preparing, um, which will be uh, another platform of the Triennale uh, and will be launched later this year. Well, if there are no questions, I think I'll just pass it to Shara Reji to uh, close the evening. Sure. Um, <coughs> well, uh, thank you so much to the speaker today. Um, um, Nima and Bipi, I think that your work, I mean, being able to hear your thoughts that you've collected over so many years and just being able to hear and see some of these ideas um, on our screen and for it to live on. Hopefully we'll be putting the live session today will be available online and the YouTube uh, will also put up the recording to, from today's uh, on YouTube. And so we really, really appreciate that you're sharing so generously your thoughts. Um, and, you know, to Cosmin, Chilasha, and Hitman, I mean, I think this is definitely a beginning uh, to the kind of vision that we've all, you've all put together. Um, and so for this to be uh, the ending of the online launch is such a privilege. And we'd like to close with that. And thank you so much for everyone for joining. Uh, we've had an amazing, uh, you know, a group of people join on Zoom, but also on Facebook, as Cosman had mentioned. So there's been over 150 people, if not more, uh, people who've come in and out, but also people who've stayed throughout. So thank you so much. We had, we had close to 200, now. in fact. So we're really very yeah, happy for that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, so um, there will be more programs, discursive programs. So hopefully there'll be about two more. But we will be announcing them once we confirm the timing um, because there's a lot of time zones that we're working out. So once we're confirmed and all the programs are set, we'll be putting them on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, and we'll also be sharing them over email whenever possible. So, you know, please do join. And then on the 1st of March, 2nd and 3rd of March, we will be having physical openings. Um, in each of the venues, and we will also be announcing those, but those will also be online, which, which we are really trying for. So uh, we hope that people from all over the world join us, but also if you'd like to come again, come. And But there'll be programs throughout uh, until the 31st. So just let us know if you're coming, um, and we can also let you know what's happening on the ground. Um, and there will be a lot of curatorial tours that we invite you to. Um, so please do stay tuned. Uh, we have a lovely, amazing communications team that's doing a great job. So thank you to, to everybody who's doing that. And um, we'll be seeing you soon and we'll close there if that's okay. Um, you are also welcome to join our uh, live stream uh, uh, where we'll be showing you behind the scenes and you can meet our team. Very, very like amazing shout out to you guys so that uh from 50 onwards so stay, stay tuned and again uh as Shirari mentioned uh we will be doing another before the physical opening we'll be doing two more of the uh, sharing sessions one in the 19th and which is like saturday and another in 26 so please stay tuned we'll update about it um thank you very much Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Say bye. Bye. <laughs>